Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, let's see now if I can share the screen here. Um, so is that okay? Looking good. Okay. So uh, I will talk about uh, how we represent concepts in our minds. It's a uh, I mean, I'm a cognitive scientist, and this is, would be really this one of the core problems in, in, in cognitive science. But as a way of zooming in, I want to contrast a couple of other paradigms for representing information. And the first one, um, the, the one that really started cognitive science, we can call symbolism. And that was built out of the metaphor that the brain is a computer. Uh, so uh, the idea was that uh, the brain functions as a Turing machine. There is some kind of program that we have to decode. Everything runs in, in some kind of symbolic uh, representation, be it zeros or one, or be it something else. Uh, and so, in brief, the brain is an information processing system. Uh, and part of the early cognitive science said that there is some kind of central processor, and then there are memory units for short-term and long-term uh, memory, and, and so on. So this, this paradigm was built on the, um, on the uh, metaphor that the brain is a computer. Um, and uh, another sim assumption about uh, this computing metaphor is that there is a, some kind of code there which represents all information. And exactly what this code is, nobody could tell, but uh, maybe the maybe the most famous is Gary uh, Fodor's idea of mental ease. There is some kind of mental language where we uh, uh, present all information, and everything is done by computing or by logical calculation and so on. So this was this was the first paradigm in, in, in um, cognitive science. The second one came to grow in the 1970s, and that's connectionism or artificial neural networks if you like. And then you break down, you, you take the brain as a, as a metaphor for, for an artificial system uh, so that you can implement in hardware, but most of the neural networks have been implemented on ordinary serial uh, computers. But the idea is that there is no real symbolic system. There is a mess of all kinds of neural activities and the neurons send the information to each other in, in parallel, you know, it's called parallel uh, processing. And the neurons uh, are connected in, in different ways with different uh, excitatory or, or inhibitory uh, connections. And the neural network learns slowly from, from uh, information. This is a very complex and a very opaque way of modeling um, information. Uh, it has some, had some successes. Currently, the, the buzzword is deep learning, where you have fairly complicated uh, neural networks with lots of, lots of layers of information. And they are quite good in some areas in, in categorizing different phenomena. For instance, you can categorize faces and, and, and things like that. Uh, so. Uh, the basic metaphor is that cognitive processes are identified with these activities of the neurons in the brain. Uh, but th there are lots of limitations of this um, uh, paradigm. It, it's good at handling special problems. It's not very good at handling general uh, cognitive pro problems. So these uh, are maybe the two major paradigms of how to represent information in, in, in modeling uh, cognition of humans and of animals. And then I and some other people have proposed that maybe the brain is more a geometric or topological uh, machine that works with, with some kind of topological or general geometrical structures. And you work with different kinds of spatial models. I mean, there are, there are more people than me uh, working in this area. But anyway, I, I proposed some 20 years ago this idea of, of uh, what I call conceptual spaces. And the core idea is that information is, is organized in, in, in spatial structures. So just to give you a very simple example of this, I mean, this is maybe the, my paradigm example here, is the color space. And this is a space that represents a human perception of colors. We have three dimensions, the hue that is a circular dimension going from red through blue and green and yellow and back to red again. And then the second dimension is uh, is uh, the intensity going from gray into more and more intense colors. 
And the third I mentioned is the uh, um, brightness going from white to black. And these three dimensions are not totally independent. Uh, when you get closer to the white area, you can make fewer discriminations, so the space is shrinking a bit, and similarly at, at the black area. So what you get <coughs> is this kind of double cone. And what it represents uh, is human judgments of similarity of colors. So the more similar two colors are, the, the closer they are located in, in this uh, color space. This is an empirical uh, finding that human color space has, has basically this structure. I mean, there are some competing models, but basically human perception is three-dimensional. While other animals may have two-dimensional color spaces, some animals have four-dimensional color spaces. So we are not, uh, there, there is no unique way of representing how we perceive uh, colors. But this is psychological space. And, and uh, if I have time, I'm going to say something about how these spatial representations connect to uh, representations in the hippocampus and the entorhinal uh, cortex. This is a new area. I'm not an expert on it, but I've been taking some interest in it the last few years. When I wrote my book on conceptual spaces, I didn't dare saying anything about what's, what's going on in the brain. But now some people are taking up this idea of of the brain as a topological or geometrical uh, machine, so to speak, and in particular using it for modeling what's going on in the, in the hippocampal uh, complex. Uh, let's see if I have time to talk about um, that. Otherwise, you can come back to it in, in the discussion period. So conceptual spaces. This is a picture of my old book. And the idea is that we build up our perception or, and our our, our concept world of, for, from a number of dimensions. Some of these dimensions are perceptually grounded, like uh, color, like space, uh, like size and weight and temperature and, 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 and things like that. Some of them are a more, a more abstract nature. And I don't have really a good uh, definition of what constitutes a, a, um, a, a domain or a dimension. But the idea is that they're grouped, dimensions are grouped into their domains. I already talked about the color domain, which there, there are three dimensions and they're grouped into this color space. And we have ordinary space. Uh, we can think of it for the time being uh, as a Euclidean space, but I would question that in, 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 in a while. Uh, that's a three dimensional space. We have size, uh, basically one color I talked about, weight is one dimensional. Force is a three-dimensional vector space. Temperature is a one-dimensional space. Shape is complicated. We don't really know how shape space looks like, but we know that shapes are more or less similar. We can judge similarities, and we could, from the, these similarity judgments, get to some kind of um, a spatial structure. Uh, I'll get back to the te techniques for that in, in, in a minute. Uh, and then, the assumption is that these domains have some kind of topological or geometric structures. Sometimes you have a metric space, sometimes you have an order space, sometimes you just have a graph. Uh, the structure of the spaces may have different um, qualities, so to speak, or may have different mathematical uh, representations. So I picked the color space because that's a non-trivial thing. Uh, or, yeah, that, that's an example of a non-trivial -non -tri topology. And if you're a bit familiar with harmony space, uh, uh, Roger Shepard had proposed, has proposed that harmony space has, is torus shaped. So that's an, another uh, non-trivial uh, space. Uh, now, my idea, this is, I, I think, the, the idea I've stressed the most in comparison to other people who have worked with uh, geometric representations of, of uh, information is that I identify a, a concept with a convex region of a domain or, or a set of domains. So I'll get back to that distinction uh, quickly. So for me, this idea of convexity is very central for uh, our analysis of, um, of, of convex. And I'll try to explain why. So let's just take the color spindle again. Uh, and uh, we have colors here. So different languages have different color words, different basic color words. Some languages have only two, basically dark and, and light. 
some have three that would be dark light and red some have more and and um, uh, yeah uh, uh, western european languages have basically the same uh, set of of uh, basic color words but for each of, each of these color words we can identify a region and that's the region where we normally would put uh, put um, the name red on on a, on a on a color chip that we are presented with. Typically, typically these experiments are done with what's called Mansell color chips, and uh, people are asked, "What do you call this color in your language?" And then you can group them into different uh, regions. And uh, so the idea of convexity is simply that if something is called red, one chip is called red, and another chip is also called red, then anything in between is also called red. That's the definition of convexity. For any two points in the region, any point in between is also in the, in the region. And in my book, I made a prediction that uh, in, in all languages, all basic color terms are denote convex regions of, a, um, of, a, of the color space. And I'll get back to that prediction in, in, in a few minutes. So. So then the question, why is this so important to, to emphasize convexity? And convexity is really a geometrical notion. I mean, you need the notion of betweenness. Mm -hmm. and you can define betweenness even for graphs. I mean, that's, uh, that's no problem. So it doesn't only cover metric spaces. You can, you can use it for all kinds of spaces where, where you have the notion of betweenness uh, uh, available. And that's a quite, quite a uh, general uh, notion. One reason why this is interesting, it connects to prototype theory in, in psychology. And prototype theory was developed by Eleanor Roche in the early 1970s, and it says that there are most more or less typical elements of a category. So one example is that a robin is more a typical bird, a typical example of, of a bird than an ostrich. Uh, uh, an orange is more typical uh, uh, fruit than a uh, durum fruit. Uh, or, or a grape uh, or whatever. So Eleanor Ross showed that from lots of categories, we can find these prototypical uh, structures. And it was also shown that when children are learning um, the meanings of category words, uh, then they learn the prototypical meanings uh, first. So for, for fruit, they would learn apple, banana, orange before they learn the more exotic uh, fruits. And now, uh, the connection here to conceptual spaces is that if you have a space, now I illustrate the space with a two-dimensional Euclidean space, you can work with other mathematical representations, but this is the simplest one. And if you know a set of prototypes, if you know the categories uh, that are, so to speak, living on this space, then you can have use a very simple rule saying that for any element in the space, you assign it uh, to the, the closest prototype. And the closest then presumes that there is a, is a metric on the space. You can measure distances. And, and if you use this rule, assign every point with the closest prototype, then you end up what is called the Voronoi tessellation. And it's a two-line two mathematical proof to show that Voronoi tessellations always end up in convex regions. And the borders may not be sharp. I mean, they may be vague. That, that's, that's not a big problem. Uh, the point here is that um, that from a prototypes plus a space with a metric, we immediately get a convex partitioning of the of the space. And uh, this is uh, well, I get back to the, the learning problem in in, in a second. Uh, I so it connects to prototype theory via something like a Voronoi tessellation. It can also handle vague concepts because. The, the, the word for red or any other, most other uh, category words we have have vague borders. They're, they're, it's very difficult to give necessary and sufficient conditions. I mean, within the symbolic tradition, people, philosophers, computer scientists, try to give necessary and sufficient conditions for, for, uh, for a concept, but that turned out to be terribly difficult. Concepts are vague, but that doesn't matter. You can have different degrees of membership in the, in, the, uh, in the region, but the rule of convexity simply says that if you have decided that one point belongs to the set and another point belongs to the set, the, where, wherever you are in, in relation to the va vague border, then anything in between will also be there. So this functions well with a notion of, of vagueness. That's not really a problem for this, um, this theory. 
And then I come to this learning thing. So uh, what's noticed is that children learn the meaning of new words extremely quickly. Uh, they, they need only a couple of examples, maybe sometimes only one example, to grasp the meaning of, of, uh, of a concept. And if you try to do this with uh, symbolic paradigms, if you try to do it with connectionism, this becomes extremely difficult. I mean, neural networks can learn to classify based on input, but typically neural networks would need lots of examples to find a fairly stable uh, representation of, of a concept. So how can children learn uh, new, the meaning of new words so quickly? Well, if you assume that they have some kind of basic space that I've picked up from perceptual structures or from, from uh, other means, so then it's quite easy to explain it. So assume that we, again, we have a two-dimensional uh, space here with, with, um, with uh, a distance metric. I mean, these are quite strong assumptions, but let me make them just for, for simplicity here. And suppose we are learning, uh, the, the child is learning birds. So they've seen a couple of examples of ducks. These are three examples of ducks in this two-dimensional bird space. In general, I think bird space is much more complicated. And these are three examples of swans. Uh, and these are three, I mean, or maybe geese, and these are three examples of, of, of swans. They differ in, in size and, and shape and, and maybe some other characteristics. And um, uh, so on the basis of these few examples, the, the child can then form a kind of air average. And this average I've now marked with crosses here. And these crosses, you can take as a prototype. The prototype may not exist, it may never have been observed, but we can think of it as a kind of average of, of what, what has been observed. And once you have these averages, once you have these prototypes, I mean, this can be defined, the average can be defined as soon as you have one single example, then you can use the averages to ca calculate the Voronoi tessellation, and the child can generalize from the examples to uh, apply the, the categories to new elements it, it, it seeks. So maybe it has learned seeing these three uh, ducks and geese and, and, and swans. And then comes a, a fairly odd new bird. Uh, it, it looks more like the prototype for goose than the prototype for a uh, duck that the child has learned. But the father of the, of the child insists that this is indeed a duck. It may be a mandarin duck or something, uh, a slightly odd form of duck. And then the child accepts this. Father has has uh, the, the right to determine. I mean, say what what is the meaning of the word duck, and then it means that now the child has to adjust its its uh, concept of duck a little bit. So the average will move from uh, from this location to that one, and consequently the Voronoi border will uh, will move. And this shows that that the the concept borders are not fixed. Dependent on our experience, we will we will um, uh, adjust them. But the more experience we have, the less a new example will influence the, the, the prototype. That is the, the average of this. Now, this story is a very simplified story of what I think goes on in reality. But it's a, it's a, it's a first grade uh, mathematical model uh, or a first appro approximation of a mathematical model that shows that once you have distances, once you have the spatial re relation, Learning from few examples can be very easy. I mean, you don't have to have many examples to, to learn the borders of, of, of a category. So using this structure of, of um, the geometrical structure as, as given, I mean, that's an assumption I make here, uh, then you can explain uh, at least some aspects of how children can learn new words for categories so extremely quickly uh, as they do. So I think this is a benefit of of uh, this uh, geometric approach. Uh, so it makes learning more efficient and it also provides a model of uh, com how generalization works. So these are some uh, um, arguments for why uh, convexity is a, is a good idea when you're looking at how concepts are, are representations. They, they, uh, this uh, really gives you an efficient way of representing concepts. And uh, yeah, uh, you can form computational models of this if you like. 
Uh, some people have tried and, uh, well, uh, there, are, there are lots of things to, to be done in this area, but that's not what I want to talk about um, today. So that's the, that's the uh, basic theory, I mean, some of the basic ideas behind this theory of conceptual spaces. Then a couple of years ago, I wrote my second book in this uh, area. Um, and uh, that's called the Geometry of Meaning. And there I try to apply the uh, theory of conceptual spaces to showing how we can represent the meanings of different word classes. And I focused on the major word classes like adjectives, nouns, verbs and prepositions. And I will talk about each of these uh, uh, word classes a little bit. So uh, when you learn about word classes at, at school, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, when you learn about the word classes at school, you learn that adjectives stand for properties of objects, uh, nouns stand for things or groups of things, verbs stand for actions, and preposition stands for uh, spatial relations. You learn some kind of semantics of these, these uh, word classes. But if you then study linguistics, you learn syntactic markers for, for the word classes. You learn that you learn that um, nouns have plurals, uh, uh, verbs have tenses, and, and so on. There are different syntactic markers. And this is how linguists normally define uh, word classes. I want to go back to our old school days and give a semantic definition of word classes. So let me start by doing adjectives because they are, they are simplest from a mathematical point of view. And this is my simple characterization of what an adjective or what most adjectives, the ones that uh, children learn the first at least. And my characterization is that adjectives correspond to a convex region of a single domain. And I, I hope you notice this idea of single domain because that will come back uh, at a few places later in my, uh, in my talk here. So what does this mean? Well, I already gave you the, idea, the, word, the example of, of color words. They all refer to the color domain, and they all refer, refer to convex regions of the, of the color domain. But there are lots of other adjectives. So we can take heavy and light, which um, uh, refer to the weight domain, and they, have, they divide the weight domain. Heavy is one end of the weight domain, light is the other. You have hot and cold, that refers to the temperature domain. You have bitter, that refers to the taste domain. The taste has four or five dimensional space. Uh, you have the words like round that refer to the shape domain and exactly what that domain, uh, what, what is the geometry of that domain, we, we don't know yet. But still, it's, it's, it's a, there are lots of words for, for, for shapes. So I make this prediction that adjectives all correspond to convex region. Maybe there are counterexamples, but most of the, so to speak, uh, simple adjectives that children learn first, they uh, fit with this uh, characterization. And from the prediction that, that the adjectives correspond to convex regions, uh, I'm sorry, from, from the rule that uh, adjectives correspond to convex regions, I can make the prediction that there is no adjective that means green or orange, because that would not be a convex region of color space. So uh, that wouldn't, shouldn't occur in any, any natural language. And, if you can find counterexamples, I would be very unhappy, but uh, uh, I would have to accept them. So, but uh, what I'm saying is that this is, this is an empirical prediction that can be tested. And furthermore, this idea of a single domain leads to the prediction that there is no adjective that means long and hot. Because that, I mean, in, in a natural language, of course, we can define the new words that have these meanings. But these are not words that show up in the, in the uh, language that children start learning. Uh, because these, uh, such an adjective would involve two domains. And uh, that's forbidden according to my, my uh, hypothesis here. So these are two empirical predictions. I haven't tested them extensively. I'm not an empirical uh, person myself. But uh, Gerhard Jäger in Tübingen uh, in, took, there is a world color survey where you have data from uh, 110 languages. And uh, these data come from uh, Mansell color chips like these. People from the different languages have been asked, what do you call this 
word, what, what do you call this um, color in, in, in your language? And, and then you, you can potation the, the color space, the, the color spindle as I, I showed you. And he showed that 94% basically of the data could be um, uh, explained by convex partitioning. So, and this is a fairly high figure. It's not 100%. The, one of the main reasons it's not 100% is that for some of the languages, you only had one or two um, informants. And if you have one or two informants, there is a lot of noise in their judgments of, of the colors. And so the, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with this figure because uh, it, it is surprisingly high that, that we get um, such a nice partitioning of all the color words in all the 110 languages into uh, convex, uh, convex regions. So I take this as fairly strong evidence for the hypothesis that all color words correspond to convex uh, regions. Then for other regions, we still need to do the, um, do the uh, empirical work. Uh, and I'll give you one more example on how this can be studied a, a bit later when I get to words. So this is what I wanted to say about the uh, adjectives. Um, and uh, these are simple words because they refer to single readings. Now we get to nouns. And I will focus on nouns for objects. Because again, these are nouns that children learn first. And we need to explain uh, that before we get to more abstract nouns. And actually, I don't really have a good theory of how we do represent abstract nouns. But like, let's take a word, simple word like apple, a concrete uh, object. And what distinguishes nouns from adjectives is that nouns refer to lots of domains. So the meaning of the word dog uh, has, uh, a dog has a, a, has a color, a shape, a size, a weight, a temperature, a sound, a smell. I mean, it has, has values in regions of, 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 of lots of domains. So that's a basic distinction between most nouns and, uh, and uh, I wouldn't say that all nouns refer to single domains, but uh, to several domains, but most do. So for an apple, you can have then, then um, I, I take in the four, or, yeah, four basic domains here. When you're a child, you learn about the color of apples and you learn that they are red, red green and yellow. They are not blue and they are not black. Uh, that they belong to that region of the color space. And when it comes to the taste space, you have, I mean, you have sweet, sour, bitter, and salty as the four basic dimensions. Some people would like to add umami as the fifth dimension here. But anyway, when it comes to apples, it's mainly uh, sweetness and sourness dimensions that, that are in, uh, involved. I mean, we don't find salty apples, uh, typically at least. And when it comes to shape, it's the round region. I mean, I'm not, uh, what distinguishes pears from apples is the, the, the shape basically. Otherwise, pears are taste uh, quite similar to apples and so on. Uh, and then when you learn more about apples, you can uh, add more domains like nutrition values, sugar, vitamin C, and, and, and so on. And if you really become a, an expert, if you become a pomologist, as it's called, then you learn about even further dimensions of apples like skin type and flesh type and seed and, and uh, what not. So this example shows that the number of domains that is attached to a, an object, it grows over time as you learn more about the object. When you're a child, you learn about these three domains, but then when you grow up, you learn more things about apples. So the number of domains is associated with a noun may not be fixed. You pick up a few when you learn the first me when you first learn the meaning of the word, and then you can add uh, more domains. Now, uh, I say that uh, a, a, an object category, uh, I mean, the property is what's represented by an adjective, but an object category is represented by a number of convex regions in different domains. So I'm still claiming that the, the regions in the domains are, are convex. But these regions hang together in, in different ways. And one way is that some domains are more important than others. So, so um, for apple, I mean, the, maybe the taste and the, uh, and the uh, sh um, shape domain are the most important ones, at least when you're a child. Uh, and furthermore, um, these prominence values can change when you uh, learn more about the concept. But I, I don't want to spend time on this. And then secondly, 
you know about correlations about the domains. So you know that a, a red apple is in general sweeter than a green apple. There are correlations, correlations between the color of the fruit and the sweetness of the fruit. And that's part of the knowledge of, of objects. We will know that the, the, the sound, the barking sound of a, do of a large dog has a deeper tone than the barking sound of a smaller dog. There is a correlation between the frequency of the bark and the size of the dog, for, for, just to give another, uh, another example. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's a, a way of um, representing basic object categories. Now there are lots of other types of nouns and uh, uh, I've started thinking about how you can represent other types of nouns. I don't write about it in the book. This is work I'm, I'm doing very slowly at the moment. But anyway, uh, I, I think that we can um, uh, classify nouns by looking at what domains they are, which domains are most prominent for the, um, for the nouns. So these are just some first uh, hand examples of, of subclasses of nouns. So if you talk about a place, like a, uh, like a park or a square or a desert or a town, uh, it's, it's only dependent on the space domain. If you replace all the houses in the town, it's, it's still the same town because it's located at the, at the same space. Uh, or if you replace all the trees in a park, it's still the same park uh, and so on. So for places, place names, or if you have them, we only require the space domain. There is very often you learn a distinction between mass nouns and count nouns. And count nouns are typically the object nouns I've been talking about. Things that you can count as one app and two apples, or one dog and two dogs, and, and, and so on. And mass nouns normally don't have values in the shape domain. If you have a, 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 a kilo of sand and you move it from one bucket to, to, uh, to the floor or to wherever you want to use the sand, it's still the same mass of sand, but it changes shape. Uh, but the, the, the identity as mass is, is still the same. It has a weight that may have a particular material, uh, it may have a particular temperature, uh, but uh, it doesn't have a fixed, um, fixed uh, shape. Uh, and and uh, for masses, the material domain is typically the most prominent, uh, prominent, uh, like uh, water, gold, uh, air, and, and, and so on. So for Mars, the, the material is, is the most prominent, uh, prominent uh, domain. I've talked about concrete, concrete nouns and object categories domains. I mean, these are typically size, shape, uh, color, weight, and so on. These examples I gave earlier, uh, which is more important can vary. Uh, Linda Smith has shown that when you're a child, the shape domain has a, a, some kind of higher prominence. There is a shape bias among, um, among children uh, when they learn new uh, categories. Abstract nouns don't contain the space domain when I'm talking about happiness or democracy or whatever you, you want to use as an abstract example. They are not located in, in, in space. So that's, uh, that's uh, one characteristic of abstract nouns. So, uh, they may, what domain does they contain, that depends very much. And I don't really have a good theory of abstract nouns, except that they are not located in space. So then you can talk about some things being animates, like animals and humans, and maybe some other things. They require that they can act. And acting, in my analysis, means that you can exert a force. You can, you can push or pull or do things. So that's, um, that's what characterizes agents. And then you have intentional agents, then you require something like a mental domain of having a goal and your, your, your actions are directed to that point in, in, in goal space. So as I said, this is just the very first approximation of how you can use the domains to classify different kinds of, uh, of nouns. Uh, I would like to develop this area in more details and work together with linguists to, to get a more comprehensive theory of how different classes of nouns hang together with different structures of domain prominences. So that's uh, uh, one example of how you can analyze nouns. Now, actually, this domain analysis can tell you something about what you can't say in, in, in a language. 
So there are some linguistic, I mean, syntactically acceptable combinations of words. I mean, round water is perfectly possible to combine in a sentence, but it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because water is a mass noun and round is a shape noun. And mass nouns don't have shapes. So there you can't, uh, you can't, I mean, you can use it metaphorically, but there is no, no uh, non-metaphorical meaning of this. This is excluded. You can't say happy gold because happy be, uh, requires the emotion domain. I didn't talk about that. But gold doesn't allow the, um, the uh, motion domain, emotion domain. So that's another impossible combination. You can't say strong garden. A garden is a place uh, and garden can't exert forces. Uh, so uh, that, that's incomp incompatible with the force domain. So this simple domain analysis I, I gave you can give an explanation of why certain adjectives and nouns are not compatible. Uh, it, this is again a first order explanation, but at least we, we see why, why um, uh, these combinations uh, are difficult to interpret. I mean, you can give them, as I said, metaphorical uh, meanings, but that's, that's uh, beyond the, the, the primary analysis here. Uh, and yeah, one more, red happiness. Happiness is an emotion and emotion domain doesn't have calories. So. Okay, over to verbs. And verbs partly belong to actions. So here is a small movie for you and maybe you can see what these uh, patches here uh, represent. But let me try to give you about 300 milliseconds here now. So you immediately see after 300 milliseconds that this is a, a, a human person who is walking. You, own, you don't see the shape of the person. You can infer the shape. You don't see the color. You don't see the size. You don't see the weight. The only thing you see here are the relations between the body parts and how they dynamically change. And you can immediately identify what kind of actions are. Even here, the ball is, is not present, but you see that it's a basket throw. Uh, so, our brains are extremely efficient in extracting these information from these movements. And my hypothesis is that what we do in our brains is we look at the movements, but we extract from the, from the kinematics and we, we, uh, we extract the forces. I mean, mathematically, they would being judging the mass of the object and then taking the second derivative. And, and um, uh, so we identify the pattern of forces. So if I'm, if I'm waving with my hand, I mean, doing a simple uh, hand movement, I can compare that to when I'm throwing. And it's, it's a hand movement that belongs to the same part of space, but the force pattern in waving and in throwing is, is quite uh, different. And we immediately see whether somebody is waving or somebody is throwing something. Um, so my hypothesis is that it's the force domain that uh, we use to, uh, ident to categorize actions. And I would say that actions are like shapes in, in, in force domain or patterns in, in, in the force domain. And actions are similar. Uh, uh, they show prototype effects. We, there are typical ways of walking. Uh, walking is more similar to running than walking is to crawling and so on. We can do exactly the same kind of psychophysical experiments as we've done with colors and all kinds of other, uh, other things. Uh, we have to develop things in time, but um, that can be done. Uh, so again, I identify an action concept as a convex medium in the space of force patterns. I haven't given you, and uh, I don't have time uh, to give you a full formal definition of how force patterns, the space of force patterns look like, but I hope you bear with me on, on, on this one. And uh, we can actually test this. So Barbara Mort and her colleagues uh, made an experiment where they showed single, simple movies of this kind. I can think I can play it for you. A human per person performing different kinds of leg movements. Here they focus on leg movements. And they had 36 different, if I remember correctly, movements of this type. And then they asked the, the subject to watch these movies to tell how similar they are. So these were, again, similarity judgments. 
just as you make similarity judgments with the Mansell colors. And based on a multidimensional scaling, that is reducing this um, uh, similarity ad judgments to a two-dimensional space. I mean, you have to force the similarities into a space where most of the similarity judgments are preserved. Then you end up with a space like this. And these dimensions are the two dimensions that come out from the multidimensional, and they may not correspond to, um, to uh, any uh, psychophysical dimension, if you like. But there are some, there are some correspondences here. But first, let me say that each of these dots here correspond to one movie in, in, uh, uh, in the, all of the 36, or how many dots there are, maybe not 36, here, but anyway, uh, the, the, each dot is a movie. So the, and the distances be, between the movie they determine how, how um, similar they were judged by the, by the participants. And then they, the participants have to give names. What is this person doing in this, in this movie, and I guess they would say marching in, 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 in this case. Uh, and, and you see that they got all these names uh, in the small letters here, but basically they were divided into marching, jogging or running, and jumping, and then walking. Uh, yeah, walking covered a, a large area of this space. And if you look a little bit closer at the dimensions here, this dimension uh, represents basically the forces that are involved here. So the further to the right you go, the more force is involved in the, in the action. And this dimension, uh, to some extent, I mean, it may not be perfect, but to some extent, the size of the movements. Um, so marching involves uh, bigger leg movements than, than walking and uh, tiptoeing is down, down here, here, uh, for, for, uh, for instance. Now, the funny thing, or more interesting thing is that they did this for speakers of four languages. So this is the result for the, for the English speaking uh, people. They did it for English, for Dutch, for Spanish, and for Japanese. And it turned out, I mean, languages have different verbs describing these actions, but the categorizations became extremely similar. People judged the similarity uh, uh, in, in the same way, and the way the words divided the space looked very much the same. So even if the languages are quite unrelated, like English and Japanese, they, they divide these actions quite uh, into, same, into the same regions, so to speak, of this, this space. So this space is a constructed space, I mean, from uh, multidimensional scaling. So this gives some support. This is an experiment to, that gives some support to, to my idea that, that um, actions are categorized by, by uh, force patterns. And so you, here you have 36 examples of force patterns. Uh, okay, so that's some background for my, uh, for my thesis. Now let's get to the verbs. So my idea, again, is that the meaning of a verb root, I don't care about all the inflections of verbs, is a convex region of a vector space that depends, again, only on a single domain. The difference here is that now we are doing in vector regions, not as just uh, regions of a, of a domain, but the vectors in, in, in a domain. So that's what distinguishes verbs from adjectives. You can also make a distinction, and many linguists do, between manner verbs and result verbs. So manner verbs describe how you do things. You, you hit something, you walk, uh, that's a manner verb. You push something, uh, you pull something. And then the result uh, verbs are, uh, yeah, describe the result of the actions. Something moves, something uh, becomes red or reddens, or something becomes heated, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so you can make a distinction between manner verbs and result verbs. And manner verbs, this is my idea, correspond to for the force dimension. So push, for instance, is, is a manner verb. And that refers to a force vector and, and thus to the force domain. While move is a, a result verb, that moves, refers to a change in the spatial domain. Uh, and, and the result vector is then yeah, dependent on, on the spatial domain. It's a shift from one location to another. Uh, and then heat uh, refers to changes in temperature. It's a movement from one temperature to a, a higher temperature. So each of these verbs correspond to, to, to vectors, but in different domains. And the manner verbs are then characterized by referring to force domains. 
but result verbs can refer to many kinds of, uh, of uh, object domains or spatial domains and, 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 and so on. So you can have a classification of verbs. And, and again, this idea of convex region and single domain allow me to, allows me to make uh, a uh, predictions of the same type as I made for adjectives. So I predict that any natural language you look, uh, look at, you will not find verbs that mean walk and burn because that involves multiple domains. One is a man of verb and, and uh, uh, this is a result verb. And there are no verbs that mean crawl or run because that doesn't correspond to any uh, convex region in, in um, the force uh, uh, vector space uh, or force pattern space. Uh, maybe uh, walk and run, there could be verbs that, co that uh, cover walk and run, uh, definitely jog and run, um, but um, they, are, they are similar uh, movements, so they would uh, cor correspond to a convex region of, of the force pattern uh, spaces. I haven't really tested this prediction. You're happy to give me counterexamples if you can find any. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, again, I think when we look at how children learn verbs, uh, it in general fits with this um, with this pattern. So that's the story about the verbs. I will not have time to do more about it, but now we get to prepositions. And here we really get into geometry. Uh, prepositions are quite organized, some of them at least. And you will maybe get tired of me, but I propose the same uh, general semantic analysis here. Prepositions denote say, the convex regions in a single domain. That sounds exactly like the definition for, for um, adjectives, but it's, it, there is a difference and you will see uh, very soon uh, why. So you have, but the interesting thing is that there are prepositions for many domains. And most, some, some linguists have said that all prepositions are spatial, but that's not true. But many prepositions refer to the spatial domain, like above or inside and, and, and so on. But some refer to the force domain, and I'll give you examples of, of that in, in, in a minute. And on and in are examples of that. Some to the time domain, like during, and even, some to the epistemic domain, whatever that is. I mean, I, I, I can't describe it uh, in detail, but I mean, despite uh, something is true, despite something else being true, um, uh, that's uh, classified as, the, as a preposition, at least by, by many linguists. So let's look closer at different um, uh, prepositions. Okay, one factor that complicates my analysis that Prepositions very often get metaphorical uses. I mean, the, the basic spatial prepositions like over uh, that has been analyzed by Lakoff and a lot of other people uh, are used in lots of metaphorical contexts. Anyway, uh, one there, there's this interesting thing that happens with the, with the spatial um, prepositions. And that is that they are, don't, don't go by Euclidean uh, or Cartesian spaces, space coordinates anymore. They go by polar coordinates. And polar coordinates, uh, I can restrict myself to the, to the plane here. You have an origo, a point in the center, and then you have an, an angle from, from a, a baseline here. And, and this angle together with the, yeah, you have a distance in this direction. That's the, uh, that's the uh, one dimension. The other one is, is an angle from, some some fixed line here. And then of course, then you have the vertical dimension and you can have a, a third dimension, which is this angle here. So you have you have the radius of, of, of the point from, from an origo, you have two angles, but I, I'll focus on the horizontal angle here. And then the point about having polar coordinates is that that generates another difference, uh, another definition of betweenness. So all the points between A and B here, they, 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 if this is the origo, they have the same radius, but they vary in the, in the uh, horizontal angle, in the phi angle, phi coordinate here. So these points on these hatched lines, they are actually, actually all between. I mean, they, these are all the points that are between A and B here. So you get a different notion of convexity if you have polar coordinates than you have Cartesian coordinates. And that's kind of interesting. 
And together with the Dutch linguist, Jort Sass, I have proposed that when you come to prepositions, and actually I would make the same purpose, uh, proposal for, for callow words, you need to represent them using polar coordinates uh, in order to define the proper notion of, of convexity. So let's see where you end up here. Okay, that's another example of a convex, com of a line, of a straight line in, uh, in um, polar coordinates. Uh, so look, there, are, there are locational pre prepositions that describe um, positions and then there are directional uh, prepositions like uh, forward and uh, backwards and so on that describe directions. But I will only talk about the locational uh, uh, prepositions. So you have inside and outside. And uh, okay, not all, all objects are, are circular, but basically inside uh, is a convex region if you do polar coordinates and outside if i'm making the simplifying assumption that objects are circular this shaded area is a convex region in uh, in polar coordinates so similarly for near and far this region which is near the uh, the object here at center that's a convex region and far is again a, this shaded area is again a convex region and what distinguishes uh, near and far is a contextually dependent uh, parameter. What's near me here in my room is not what is near the uh, the moon, maybe may be near to the earth in comparison to the sun, for instance. Uh, so that's a, what's near and far is contextually uh, dependent. And if we do other, other prepositions, I mean, this is still the origo and the, the landmark, so to speak. Uh, and uh, then, uh, then uh, you get these regions, that's the things that are in front of the landmark. These are the ones that are things that are to the right, to the back of, and to the left of the landmark. And by introducing this notion of the landmark, this uh, explains the difference between prepositions and adjectives, because the meaning of a, a preposition is always determined in relation to a landmark. So for locational prepositions, they are regions in relation to a landmark. For uh, directional prepositions, there are paths in relation to a landmark. So they are not of the same type as, as adjectives where there is no landmark involved. That's the major semantic distinction between uh, prepositions and uh, adjectives. So, but still, I, I claim that they all have the basic meaning in a, a single domain. So, let me do a couple of example where I, examples where I think that the force domain is involved. So look at this picture here is a, is a bowl of apples and at the top is a, is a pear. And there is a spatial look, a relation between the pear and, and, and the bowl. And most people would say that the pear is in the bowl, even if it's spatially outside it, in this example. But if you have the exactly the same relation between the pair and the bowl, as in this example, most people would say that the pair is not in the bowl. Why uh, do we do make this difference? Well, the idea I have is that there is a force relation between the pair and the bowl. That is, if you move the bowl here, then the apples will move and the pair will move. While if you move the bowl here, then the, the, app, the pair will not move, at least not initially, until it's hit by the, yeah, by the rim in this case. Anyway, that indicates that, that uh, there is some kind of force relation involved in the meaning of, of in. If you do the preposition inside, then nobody would, oh, I would say, no, yeah, people would not in general say that the pair is inside the bowl. And of course, not inside here, here either. So inside is a spatial preposition, but in is a force preposition. Let's do an example with on. So in this picture, would you say that the lamp is on the balloon? Spatially, the, the lamp is above uh, or on top of the balloon. These are above and on top of these are spatial um, uh, prepositions. But I, I, I think that most people wouldn't say, they would find it odd to say that this lamp is on the balloon. And the reason here is that the, 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 the balloon exerts a force on, 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 um, on, on, on the lamp from below. And uh, that's not typically of on. Typically of on is when I put, take this glass of water and I put it on my desk here. 
uh, then there is a, a, a gravitational force that pulls the pulls the uh, glass towards the towards the uh, disk, and that's why the glass is on the table. So for me, on is also a a um, a uh, force domain uh, for a domain a preposition that, that depends on the force domain, and I can make similar analysis for against and over and under. So let's do. Uh, yeah, here's another example. The fly is on the ceiling, you say in, in English. In Swedish, we actually say this fly is in the ceiling. So there's there a difference here. Um, um, why is it on the ceiling? Well, because the, the feet of, this, of, the, of the fly exerts a force that makes it stick to the ceiling. So that's why it's, uh, there is a force relation here uh, uh, well. And similarly, you say if you if you nail a board over a hole in the ceiling, you would say it's over the hole in the ceiling, even though even though the board is below the hole. Uh, so I developed what I call a rotation test. Uh, the the button is on the shirt, and no matter how you rotate the shirt, uh, the button would still be on the shirt. Uh, uh, and if you rotate the board, the, 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 the room, the ceiling here, the board would still be over the hole in the ceiling. The rotation is um, difficult to perform here. But basically, the force relation would remain the same, even if you make a spatial rotation. And that's, um, uh, that's why, why uh, I, I, I argue that uh, the force domain is the primar uh, primary domain for, uh, for these uh, prepositions. Now it's time to, for me to sum up. And um, so what I've developed here is the semantic grounding of word classes. I've given you examples of nouns, and for them they have been given a slightly complex definition involving several domains for object categories. I've given you examples how, of how domain analysis would apply to uh, other types of nouns as well. I've identified with uh, adjectives with regions of a single domain. I've identified with prepositions with relations between a landmark and a region around the landmark or, or paths if, if it's a direction of prepositions. It's not only spatial and force, there are some other domains involved as well. And in verbs, there are either force vectors for manner verbs or result vectors for result verbs. I haven't analyzed the ver adverbs. Adverbs is a very complicated uh, uh, word class. It's, you can say it's a kind of leftover word class, but some adverbs like uh, 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 yeah, uh, a strong. Uh, no, I can't uh, give you examples. But they are they they are modifying modifying uh, the, the vectors. They are magnifying or diminishing the uh, the vectors here. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so all the, and I, I, in later papers, I've analyzed demonstratives as well. So I could add them to the list here, and then you have spatial uh, relations mainly there. Um, but the, the point I'm making here, that these, all these blue types here, here have four word classes. For them, I pro made a pro 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 the proposal that, that they all corresponds to meanings that reside within a single domain of meaning. The exception here uh, is nouns that apply to several, several uh, domains. But I would claim that for most of the word classes you find in, in, in a natural language, you can analyze them using this single domain reference. And in addition to that, they correspond to convex regions in these, um, in these uh, domains. Uh, so that's a kind. Of, these are two unifying principles for for most word word classes. I mean, the the nouns is the example. You, I still apply convexity to nouns, but I don't apply single domain reference here. And these two principles would, in my opinion, be part of the explanation for how children can learn words so quickly. If they hear that something is an adjective that's marked syntactically, then they know that there is some kind of domain where uh, the um, where the uh, adjective would refer to. Maybe they haven't learned the domain. Uh, they learn them when they grow up and they learn more and more domains, but they know that there is a particular domain. And uh, I actually have proposed also the idea that when a child learns about adjectives for a new domain, they, learn, they don't learn single words. Once they start learning color words, they can very easily learn 
to uh, new color words for uh, in the domain. And uh, I've actually been able to confirm that partially with studying uh, addictive uh, understanding in three-year-olds and five-year-olds, but I can tell you more about that if you, if you like. So I hope I've given you some kind of idea of how, how um, um, we can use geometrical structures like um, uh, convexity based on betweenness, like vector structures, uh, like a uh, convex regions and so on to understand how we get a systematic structure of uh, meanings of the meanings of, of different kinds of, of words in our natural languages. And by the way, going back to the symbolic paradigm, I mean, then you had only a distinction between predicates and variables. I mean, objects and, 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 and uh, yeah, predicates. And predicates were covering everything that is expressed by additive prepositions, verbs, and, and adverbs, and so on. And i shown by my analysis that you may have, you, you, in order to understand why we have different word classes, you may have to go into a little bit more of an analysis of how, these, how the meanings of these words are structures. And for that analysis, I would, uh, suggest uh, that you need some kind of geometrical or topological structures. So I could stop here. No, I have one more thing to say. Yeah, metaphors. Uh, I haven't, uh, but natural language is full of metaphor. And here is my simple model of how, how to analyze metaphor. So let's take the, the adjective bumpy uh, and in, in the context of the bumpy road. So bumpy means that you have a uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional spatial relation here. You have, you're moving along a road, that's the horizontal dimension, but this road changes in the, in the vertical uh, dimension. And bumpy means that there are some abrupt changes in the, in the height of the, uh, of the road. Now look at the, the metaphor, a bumpy relationship. What's happening here? Well, what's happening here is we take, we take two fairly traditional metaphors. We map time onto space, onto lay, uh, horizontal length. And that metaphor is extremely common, ex exists in, in, in most languages. We are looking forward to doing something. We have things behind us and so on. The mapping from time to space is, 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 is very common. So that's one mapping we do here, map that dimension onto that dimension. But then we also use the dimension of more is up, which is one of the, major examples in Lakoff and Johnson's book on, on metaphors, that more is up. So more problem means that you have a higher, higher problem level, so to speak. That means we are mapping the problem level on in the problems in the relationship onto the vertical dimension. And these mappings are, are, are kind of conventional. What we don't notice when we understand the, the token bumpy relationship is that our minds, not literally, but um, but um, in modern wise, actually takes the Cartesian product of these two uh, dimensions, the, the, the horizontal time dimension and the vertical Morris up dimension. And in this product dimension, you can then map the curve of your relationship, and then you can identify this as a, a bumpy road. I mean, that's the, that's, that's the metaphor. So the, the reason that we understand the, the meaning of bumpy is that we do this Cartesian product of two conventional uh, metaphors uh, totally unconsciously, but we, we somehow do it. And for me, this is an indication that we can't give symbolic definitions of, of metaphors. I, I would love to see a neural network that, that can handle this kind of, uh, this kind of metaphor. Uh, but in everyday life, we understand metaphors of this type without any big effort. And my humble explanation of this is that our brains are indeed uh, geometrical machines. So that's the end of the, the, the major part of my talk. If you like, and now I go to my host and ask whether I should say something about um, how the brain handles this as well. I think we have time for that. So feel free to go ahead. Okay, I do five, 10 more minutes, is that okay? Okay, so 
from psychology to neuroscience. I've mainly been talking about similarity judgments and, and perceptual dimensions and so on. I mean, the empirical basis for, for what most of I've been talking about here comes from, comes from cognitive psychology. Now, as I said, I, I'm not a neuroscientist and I, uh, I don't want to pretend to be one, but anyway, I got involved in some work on on the neuroscience of uh, how the hippocampus represents things. So as I said, conceptual spaces are based on judgment of similarity, basically. Now, the big question is, do these spaces that I've been talking about, the psychological spaces, have correspondence in neural structures? And, and uh, yeah, th this is a big question at the moment, uh, actually. So it's well known that there are topographic mappings in the brain, I and mean, we map uh, frequencies, sound frequencies, in onto the cochlea, cochlea. And if you unroll the cochlea, you get a nice mapping between the high frequencies coming closer to the eardrum and the low frequencies being very far up and uh, represented very far up in the cochlea. That's a simple topographic mapping between between uh, uh, sound frequency and location in in the uh, in the cochlea. We know that in the superior colliculus, information from the senses, I mean, the, the, the vision, the, the sound, and the, and the tactile uh, senses come together and it's used to represent a, a, the, the, our, our spaces, our, 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 the, the space per, that we perceive. So space is not only visual, it's also haptic and, and, and uh, auditory. And we get this unified topographic uh, representation in the superior colliculus. But recently, uh, a lot of focus has been uh, placed on how the hippocampus represents information. And in, in, in the first studies done by O'Keefe, who found these play cells in the hippocampus, and then later extended by the Mosers, uh, who find that the, the grid cells in the entorhinal cortex functions as a kind of coordinate system for the, for the places. Everything was focused at the beginning on how the rats and other animals represent the space around them. I mean, I mean the real physical um, uh, physical space. So, uh, so that that was the old old uh, uh, school, so to speak. But at the same time, it was well known that the hippocampus is essential in forming memories. So people who got damages to their hippocampi, they um, they lost the possibility of forming new memories. So how could the hippocampus have this double role of representing both space and being involved in forming episodic uh, memories? That was an enigma for some time. And then some people, uh, I got involved in a group uh, that is now in, well, Moser is in, in, in Norway, but Jakob Bellman and Christian Deller are in, in Leipzig, which so is the Mike Planck Institute. So we had the idea that um, what the hippocampus is really doing is representing conceptual spaces. And, uh, and uh, so, so this is a quote from, from, from our paper that um, placing grid cells encode positions along dimensions of experience beyond Euclidean spaces for navigation. I mean, that it, has, it can also representing uh, uh, other things. So it is more general role for the hippocampal entorhinal processing mechanism and cognition. And that could be the, the, the basis for an explanation of memories. For memories involved uh, representing information from lots of, lots of conceptual uh, domains. And we are not the only ones. And some other people uh, work in this area. They don't believe that it's really metric spaces and so on. They work with graphs and, and uh, uh, and uh, other structures, but uh, there are lots of people working on, on this idea that the hippocampus now represents um, lots of other things. And a general idea is that the grid cells function as a general coordinate system. I mean, there are different codes mapping, mapping different uh, perceptual domains. I mean, colors, uh, uh, shapes, and so on uh, onto uh, the grids, uh, I'm sorry, onto the play cells. And then these play cells are organized into a space via the, the coordinate system that is provided by the, by the grid cells. Uh, so we can then quite easily uh, explain generalization. And the other models, the other uh, geometric models, the topological models, they are, have, don't have the same capacity to explain generalization as our uh, more general um, conceptual space model here. 
So here is uh, the central idea. I mean, if you have a space, this is an artificial space with, with, with vehicles. So there are two dimensions. There is the force of the engine and there is the size of the, of the, of the uh, vehicle. And then you get different objects placed here. And then you can train people on, 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 uh, on these objects and they would correspond to play sets in the, in the, uh, in the hippocampus. And these play sets would then be uh, located in a in a coordinate space by the uh, by the grid sensor. So this is an artificial example. Example. There have been there are empirical examples of this. There is a famous one based on a bird space where where the necks and the legs of the birds are, are varying in in length, and uh, people learn to categorize birds according to this bird space, basically according to this uh, these principles. So, uh, this is a fascinating area. People are trying all kinds of new new uh, conceptual spaces and see how that can be represented in the in the hippocampus and, and one paper by bush and, and collaborators in uh, in 2015 proposed that the grid cell coding is uh, it's it's known that at different positions in the entorhinal cortex you pro you represent location at different uh, scales of of uh, resolution so there are some cells that uh, represent a rather, a rather coarse uh, uh, resolution. Then our middle, there are different layers of, of granularity. So in this example, there are three layers of where, how the rat represents its position. And it's known that in the grid cells, there is a, a cyclical thing. So um, uh, the same grid cells comes back after a time here, but still, each point, I take this point, the goal point, it's represented by a particular set of coordinates. And these coordinates are then actually uh, polar coordinates, and uh, these are circular, um, uh, uh, in these different layers. So this model would be one example how, how, how you could go from uh, this uh, uh, cyclical representation in the grid sets to a unique representation of a uh, location in space. I'm not saying, uh, and, and this uh, representation is done by some kind of Fourier transformation uh, from the physical location into these, uh, into these um, cyclical uh, coordinates here. I'm not saying this is the only model, but it's one model that can explain the, the, uh, navi the spatial navigation by the, by, by the rats. And uh, in, uh, as far as I know, an un unanswered question is whether this model can generalize to to other forms of conceptual spaces that are um, are uh, that are coded in the in the hippocampus, this is uh, still an open empirical questions. But as I said, the last five seven years, uh, this area has uh, this area of study has really exploded, and lots of neuroscientists are, are trying to establish how the hippocampus does this work and what things can be represented. In, um, in, uh, in, in these ways. Uh, but what is common is that they all presume some kind of topological or geometrical structure of the information that is, uh, that is uh, uh, decoded by the, by the hippocampus. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much.